together. It it is the um, second time we've done this, so I guess some experience from last year has rolled over. But I do hope that next year we will all get chances to um, meet in person again, which would be very nice. So let me share my screen. Right. So let me say, here I am in Wellington, New Zealand. So I thought many of you won't have been here. So this is what Wellington looks like on a good day. I have to say today is not a good day. It's midwinter here and it's very cold. I was just complaining to Rob and Mark before that my feet are frozen, which I think is not a problem many of you are having in other parts of the world. But anyway, that's what Wellington's like. It's a beautiful city and I enjoy being here. But today I'm here to talk about extensive reading, grammar and the language teacher. So when I when I got this invitation to, to talk, I thought, great, this is a chance for me to think aloud about something that has been exercising my mind for a little while now. Because as we all know, you know, much has been said and written about the benefits of extensive reading for language learning. And I think in particular, vocabulary gains have been often investigated. Now, this, this makes really good sense because um, vocabulary knowledge is obviously important. It is one of the possibly the most important predictor of comprehension in reading, for example. And as was said a long time ago, you know, vocabulary is essential for communication. The, the, there's that famous quote from around 50 odd years ago, which says, while without grammar, very little can be conveyed, without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. And yet, while vocabulary has understandably attracted lots and lots of attention, Grammar has been largely overlooked. And we get a sense of this, really. If we go online and look at the Extensive Reading Foundation bibliography, we find that the entries for uh, vocab occupy about 13 lines on screen, whereas grammar doesn't even reach to two lines on screen. So that gives some idea of the attention that's been given to vocab as opposed to grammar. So in this talk, I want to focus on some of the problems that unfamiliar grammatical constructions can cause in extensive reading. And remember, this is about, you know, you're reading for pleasure, you're reading for understanding. So grammar that causes problems in understanding. And I want to think about the grammar learning that is possible from extensive reading. So I'm going to begin by uh, reviewing some of what we think we know about extensive reading and grammar. And in a way, I'm essentially summarizing those one and a half lines of the Extensive Reading Foundation bibliography. And once I've done that, I'll move on to some specific examples and some other thoughts. So, no, this is not New Zealand. Um, this is supposed to be Fiji. So why Fiji? Well, the classic, the foundational study for extensive reading is of course the, the Fiji book flood that was conducted in the late 70s, early 80s. And it's, I'm showing this because to make the point that it's not the case that grammar hasn't received some attention. So in this Fiji book flood, just to remind you, the, the researchers, Eli and Mangabai, involved 12 schools and they divided them into three groups, a control group who followed the normal curriculum, uh, uh, a group who did silent reading and a group who did shared book reading. And they ran this for one school year and they did lots of tests at the end of that school year. And they found basically great benefits from the, um, the exposure to reading, to extensive reading. And one of the measures they used was what they called an English structures test. So at one level, the, the learners, uh, did 35 multi-choice items that was at grade four this is primary school and that was grade five and they had 20 open-ended items which i think must have been short short sentences with gaps to complete and they found especially for grade four on the 
grammar tests that the exposure to text that the extensive reading led to significant improvement. They didn't, to be honest, find the same for the grade five, but they put this down in part to the fact that one of the teachers who was supposed to be doing the shared book treatment didn't do it because she or he didn't believe in it. So that clearly muddied the results. Anyway, they continued this, this for a uh, second year and they did more tests and they did find significant gains for grammar as well as the other uh, language skills they were looking at. So here we have a good example of an extensive reading study that looks at general proficiency gains and uses a measure of grammar as one indicator of those proficiency gains. And since that time, in Fiji, there have been many, many studies, and they've all found much the same thing, as we know. So even about 10 years after the Fiji book flood was studied, you know, Bill Grabe was summarizing the benefits of extensive reading like this. And I don't think anything has changed in the intervening, what, three decades. You know, so what he's saying here, you know, longer concentrated periods of silent reading, in other words, extensive reading, build vocabulary and structural awareness, in other words, grammar knowledge, develop automaticity, enhance background knowledge, and so on. So not much has changed. But I think it's interesting to think, how is this process happening? And I'm going to refer here to a, a study that was carried out uh, mainly by Mitsui Tabata Sandam a few years ago, looking at the learning of Japanese. And and in this study, one of the participants in her reading journal talked about taking mental notes. So she was reading the story. It wasn't so much the story she enjoyed, but she was attracted by the style. And she says, I often take mental notes when reading Japanese. When I see grammar, I understand, but can't use myself. So obviously, I'm choosing this quote because it's about grammar. And so... Mitsui and I were talking and said, well, maybe we should ask her what she meant by mental notes. So we did this and she explained. So she's talking about, she's comparing it to translation and it's more positive than translation. And she uses this culturally specific term, eureka feeling. So Eureka is a Greek word. It, this is a, a, it refers to the fact that a, a famous Greek philosopher apparently uh, found the solution to a problem and he called out Eureka, Eureka, which means I've got it, I've got it. And in the story I heard, he ran naked down the street calling out Eureka, Eureka. Okay, so she says he gets this Eureka feeling. In other words, she's got it, uh, he's got it, she's got it. And she goes on to explain, it wasn't a case of striking words or structures I didn't understand. It was more of striking similar patterns that I could understand or was coming to understand better. So I think what this point, make, what these quotes make are three points. Number one, she was experiencing successful language learning through extensive reading. Big tick, excellent. Number two, it's making the point that one of the things that extensive reading provides is opportunities for, let's call it repetition, but you get to, and it's through the repetition that the learning happens. And the other thing I think these makes, that this makes is that extensive reading is providing an opportunity for her to practice language she already knows. And this is a point I'm going to come back to later. So we have all these general studies all these studies that look at general proficiency and they include grammar as a measure, so they make claims about grammar learning through extensive reading. Okay. We also have a set of studies that focus on extensive reading and, and writing. And again, two of the early important studies are these two. So the first one took place in the UK, the second one in Pakistan. Very good, you know, one an, an input rich environment, one an input poor environment, one ESL, one EFL. And again, they, they make claims for uh, improvements in accuracy, in other words, grammar, in the student's writing, 
through exposure to extensive reading. Again, these were general proficiency gains. And as I recall, they were using more holistic measures rather than analytical measures to do this. So up until recently, a lot of the claims for grammar learning through extensive reading are based on global proficiency measures. Recently, though, there's starting to be more of a focus on specific measures, specific items. And, and all this research, as far as I'm aware, seems to be taking place in Japan and South Korea. So these are some recent studies. And I, I'm not here to critique these studies, but I am going to say a couple of things which are, I guess, critique, critiques. Um, I think in the in the the ACCA study, the 2020 study, um, one thing that's uh, so so she was looking at um, two infinitives used as verbs. Okay, but but what's very clear in the study is there's a very big role for teacher intervention. And to me, anyway, in reading the study, it wasn't clear whether the claimed benefits were coming from extensive reading or from separate teacher-produced materials that the same learners were also being exposed to. Um, similarly with the Rowe and Kim study, it's, it's a very interesting study. Um, but in terms of strong claims about benefits of extensive reading, uh, there are some questions I think you could make around this. Um, so the group who was doing extensive reading had 24 hours more exposure to written text than the comparison group in a four-week period. That's a lot. And not only were they doing extensive reading, but they were also doing writing. So I, I feel it's slightly problematic to claim these benefits for extensive reading when the groups were being compared are not experiencing similar things. But I think it's fantastic that we now start to have some new research, which is looking at specific grammatical gains from extensive reading. And this is where I think we need to be going a bit further. Okay. Now, the final thing I want to say by way of background is this. There are other thoughts and the other thoughts are probably captured best by the quote on the next slide from Stephen Krashen. Reading is the only way, the only way, in case you missed it, we become good readers, develop a good writing style, an adequate vocabulary, advanced grammar, advanced grammar, and the only way we become good spellers. So this is a much stronger claim for the benefits of extensive reading for grammar learning. And this particular school of thought, uh, which is all very current, um, is that extensive reading is the only way, is all you need, really, that if you read, you're going to get all these benefits. And this is a question that I want to also return to a little bit later. Okay. So that's where I think we are now in our understanding of extensive reading and grammar. And I want to move on now to talk about some of the problems for understanding that can be caused by grammar. Now, if you read the abstract for this talk, you will know that I'm going to be drawing on examples from French. Uh, this is because, well, this is two reasons for this. Number one, I've been thinking about this question for a while, and I've been thinking about it based on my own language learning in French, my own extensive reading in French. So I'm drawing on examples from my own experience because that's where my thinking began. But I think it's also really important to remind us all that, hey, guess what? English is not the only language that people learn in the world. There are other languages as well. So let's think about those and be inclusive. So I'm going to be talking about problems that I think, problems for understanding that I think are caused by gr grammar. And I'm drawing here on my reading in French of the Harry Potter series. Now, before I 
give these examples, I'm going to say one other thing. I, I wrote some preliminary thoughts about this about two or three years ago in reading in a foreign language. And um, th there was one response. I won't go into it in, in great detail. But essentially, the person was saying, um, my problem wasn't grammar. It was that I was not reading extensively, that my vocabulary was not sufficient to read and understand Harry Potter. Now, we could get into an I say, you say situation here. I think all that's relevant as response is for me to say with my hand on my heart that I can read these books fluently with very good understanding. There's very little vocabulary that is unfamiliar to me. If we did that rule of thumb test, you know, how many words on a page do you not know to decide if something's suitable for extensive reading? There is no question but that I'm reading these extensively and that my problems for understanding, when they do occur, are not caused by vocabulary. So I doubt that person is in the room at the moment, um, but I do want to make that point. So let's look at some of these problems that I think are caused. And I'm going to start with one that is fairly, um, let me rephrase that. I'm going to show four structures uh, here. And I think three of them are things that beginner and elementary learners of French are exposed to very early on in their learning of the language. So the first one is about gender and articles. So the sentence, I, you will be pleased to know I've got a translation in English. It may not be a good translation, it's my translation, but um, there is a translation. So three times each week, they studied plants and mushrooms under the direction of a small, nicely plump sorcerer <laughs> um, called Professor Shrav. Okay, so that's what the sentence means in English. And here is the sentence. And, and I've highlighted in red the articles. So the first two are the plural definite article, the, not marked for gender. So it's not showing whether plants and mushrooms are, are masculine or feminine. Um, and then we have the next one is la, which is the, again, the definite article, but it's singular. And this is feminine. This is followed by the indefinite article, which is also marked as being feminine because it has the E at the end. And then we have this last one, which is the definite article again. Uh, but this one is marked as masculine. So what's the problem? I, I think part of the problem comes from the fact that the teacher is marked as masculine. So there's an association between teacher, uh, uh, yeah, teacher and, and, and the, the masculine article. So what's the problem? The problem I think can become, do learners notice the gender of the characters? This character in Harry Potter is not a major character. So if you ask the learner reading it afterwards, um, was that teacher a man or a woman? I think there's a good chance that they would not have picked up on that important information conveyed grammatically. And just as further support for that idea, there was a book I read a few years ago by Patsy Lightbound in Canada. And she told this anecdote of her, I think it was her son. Um, so as you probably know, in, in Canada, French and English compete for 
dominance is perhaps one way to put it. Um, and so her son was, I, I'm guessing his first language English, um, was learning French and he'd read the story. And, and Patsy in conversation with her son had realized that he hadn't actually noticed that the main character was a girl and not a boy. So he'd missed all the grammatical markers that identified the, the gender of the character in the story. Some of you, if you know French, you know, might be thinking, oh, okay, there are lots of other markers as well, which there are, but I'm not going to draw attention to those. So that's one possible cause of misunderstanding that grammar can contribute. Th this example also highlights another one, which is also relevant to learners of English. And this is about, I meant to change this, pre and post modification of nouns. So in many languages in the world, oh no, in English, nouns and noun phrases are, uh, pre-modified, the adjectives come before the noun or the noun phrase. In many languages, they come after the noun or noun phrase, or as in this case, both before and after. So this is another cause of potential misunderstanding and uh, non-comprehension in reading caused by grammatical structures. And I'm not going to go into this one uh, in any detail, but this is a nice example of a cross-linguistic influence that can cause difficulties. And if you're interested in this, there's a very nice uh, recent article in Reading in a Foreign Language, which looks at uh, Spanish learners in Argentina and um, their comprehension of pre-modification on, on noun phrases. Um, interesting article, lots of food for thought, not, not actually extensive reading, but still related to this issue. Okay, let me move on to the next one. Negation. So again, this is something that language learners in French learn very early. I, I think possibly the first thing people learn to say in French is je ne parle pas. I don't speak. Because if you go to French and they speak to you, the last thing you want is to people to, you know, say je ne parle pas, je ne parle pas, I don't speak. Um, so ne pas is, is the negative construction that people learn pretty quickly. Three quick examples. We prefer that they leave us in peace. In French, the, the, the key word here I want you to focus on is the word that means that, highlighted in purple. Again, something that learners of French get exposed to really, really early on. And then we have a sentence like this, don't you see that I'm George? And here we have that negative construction that um, learners get exposed to very, very early. And here I've chosen this example because it's combined with that k that means that. But it, it's a very simple, easy to unpack sentence, I, I believe. So where do the problems come? Here's the next one. There is only one, Gringotts. What's the challenge to understanding? And I have to say, this is one I still experience from time to time. So you see the, the n, and it triggers in your mind that reaction, not, nipa, not. So you have this expectation of what's coming next, at least as a first language English speaker. But there's no pa, is there? There's just this word again, the one in purple. And so the whole meaning changes from there is not to there's only. So again, these grammatical constructions and um, are likely triggers for lack of understanding. Occasioned here, I think, by the familiarity with the more common structure. Okay, just one more example, and then we'll leave the French for a little bit. Venir, another, a verb that is learned very early on in French. You've come to get your supplies. Nice and straightforward. 
here you have the past participle of the verb. You've come. Very easy to understand, no problem. Next example. So you can see here the word come. Okay, good. Here's the sentence, a bit longer. Now, what's happened? What's happened? By adding the de after the near, the whole meaning has changed. It's actually not about coming into, that's here. It's signaling the moment of something just having happened. Now, you could read the sentence a little differently from my translation and still get the whole meaning. You could read it as uh, Harry felt um, a strange sensation as he was coming into. You would still get the meaning. You would still understand, but you would miss some shades of difference. So you might say to yourself, oh, does this really matter? I don't know. You can make your own decision about that. But the big question, I think, is how do you become aware? How do you notice these shades of meaning that are conveyed by grammatical constructions? So those are some examples from French. And I want to briefly um, consider why grammar and vocabulary might be different in extensive reading. So back to Harry Potter. Back to Harry Potter. Very early on in Harry Potter, you will, okay, no, I'll talk about my experience. Very early on in reading Harry Potter, I came across this word. I didn't know what it meant. What did I do? I skipped it. I could understand the sentence. I knew it was a thing. Okay. okay. Reading on. I think, okay, doesn't matter, not important, keep going, enjoy the story, blah, blah, blah. But then, you meet the word again a few pages later and you pause and think, oh, I think I saw that word just before. Maybe it's an important word. Maybe I should think about it for a moment. And so let's say I, I did that and maybe I made some sort of vague guess as to what the thing was. And then reading on again, I see the word again. I think, oh, there's that word again. It must be important. What did I think it was? Hmm. Do I still think it means that? And so on. So I'm doing what I hope we all train our learners to do, to identify something that's important and, and guess from context, construct meaning around it. So with this word, I have to say, it was extremely difficult. Um, and I think on this one, I, if I remember correctly, I did have to go you know, to a dictionary or, or at least pick up my phone and Google it. Um, because the meaning wasn't clear from the context, because this word means a slug. And this word was not in the context of a garden. If you've read Harry Potter, you might have noticed that J.K. Rowling seems to have a thing about people vomiting slugs. Okay, quite a hard word to guess from the context of vomiting. However, this is a word which I learned through noticing it in Harry Potter and yeah, and finding out what it meant and remembering it. And if ever I have a conversation in French about pests in the vegetable garden, I will be able to talk about slugs in French, which will be a great accomplishment. Now, I think the important thing to take away from this is that this is an example of new learning. So why? Why do I think grammar might be different from learning vocab. Well, as I've already exemplified, you can understand perfectly well thanks to vocab without getting some of the finer points of meaning which conveyed through grammar. So if we're doing extensive reading, you know, lots of easy, enjoyable reading, you can read, you can enjoy, it's easy, you understand, no problems. Related to that is that unlike vocabulary, specific grammatical challenges, and especially as you become a more advanced learner, might occur fairly infrequently. So therefore, you don't have so many opportunities for that space repeated retrieval. So takeaway from this, 
at the very least, incidental grammar learning is much harder than incidental vocabulary learning. Which makes me think there's a really important role for intervention. And if you think about the title of my talk, the last three words were, four words were, and the language teacher. So here's that example again. Here's the question. Why did I notice? Why did I notice that grammatical construction and the meaning it conveyed? I'm doing this autonomously. Okay. Now, what I haven't told you is I also um, spend 15 to 30 minutes a day using Duolingo to maintain my French. Because in New Zealand, of course, we don't have much French to use outside. So here I was using Duolingo, and I, they have these really quite cool little stories that you can read. And so here, here she's saying, my boyfriend and I, and I know this, break up. And I think, my boyfriend and I are coming to break up. Oh, that doesn't make sense. What does it mean? Now, Duolingo has this useful function. You can touch, there's a, you can um, tap the underlined word and a pop-up comes along. Thank you, Duolingo. Just broke up. Oh, I thought to myself, that must be what the D after is conveying. So I was picking up and learning this thing through a form of intervention a language learning app. And because I want to leave a bit of time at the end for questions, I'll, I'll, I'll just speed up a little bit. Um, but I had a similar thing also using Duolingo. Suddenly I was doing a, a lesson on le gérondif or gerunds. So, so words like passing. So I was doing this lesson. I thought, oh, and I was reading Harry Potter. And suddenly I was noticing all over the place, these gerunds popping up, the form I've highlighted in red, which I hadn't noticed consciously before because I was reading and understanding, but I wasn't paying attention to the grammar. Now, I can't resist saying, you know, there are lots of books with, um, and teachers can intervene as well. So it's not just about autonomous learners working by themselves with, you know, books and, and language learning apps. And I can't resist, you know. So in a book like this, um, teaching ES, you know, reading and writing, there's a whole chapter which has uh, uh, a big section on the types of things that teachers can do in the classroom to draw attention to specific grammatical constructions. And I've, I've written about this sort of thing uh, previously um, and uh, exemplified how teachers can do it in the classroom using intensive reading. So, what are some of the questions that these ruminations trigger? I think an interesting question is, so, so what are the grammar challenges that exist for learners of the target language at different levels. Um, yeah, so, so globally, what are the grammar challenges that exist? So if you're learning, if you're an English speaker learning French, what can we predict would be some of the grammatical challenges? If you're a Vietnamese learner of English, you know, what are some of the grammar challenges? So we can probably make some predictions using, for example, contrastive analysis. In Vietnamese, no articles. English, articles. Therefore, articles are likely to be a source of, of problem. We also need to think, therefore, with that example, about the different L1 backgrounds, because different learners will have different challenges. And we already know this. We've known this for a very long time, that if you're learning let's say English, and you come from a, a French background, it will take you a lot less time to get to, let's say, A1 or A2 than it will if Arabic is your first language. So we already know that there are different language learning challenges depending on different backgrounds. 
what, one question I haven't put on here is, you know, what are the different challenges for learners at different levels of proficiency? Because we also know, don't we, that learners have a built-in syllabus, that you can learn certain things at certain times, and at other times, those things are sort of unlearnable. I think a huge question is, is reading enough? Is reading, extensive reading, enough for new learning to occur? And if it's not, how best then do we intervene, which may be teaching, it may be us having a role, or it could be learners working autonomously to promote effective learning, or in other words, to promote noticing. Because as we know, again, from research, you're not going to learn something if you don't notice it. And the last, the last question on, oh, it's not going to come. What's happened? The last question is, does extensive reading actually teach new grammar or is it simply providing practice with what we already know? And I think to date, the research tends to suggest that it's the latter, that people are not learning new grammar through extensive reading. So these are some of the questions that are floating around in my mind. In a moment, you can tell me if you think these questions are, are worth thinking about. Maybe they're just sort of academic niceties that mean nothing in the real world. Or maybe this talk has triggered some of your own questions that you think could be worth answering. I'd really like to hear. So just to conclude, some of the references I've been um, um, re referring to uh, on this slide, um, this is the time uh, it was again in reading in a foreign language, which um, oh, I suppose I should declare I'm co-editor at the moment, but uh, it is a journal that anyone can access anywhere in the world. It's it's a wonderful peer-reviewed journal that is truly open access, so you don't need an expensive subscription. Um, and some of the more recent research I'm talking about has, has appeared here and here and here. But you'll be able to see those on the recording later if you want to. And I will now stop the sharing. And if I got my timing right, we've got about five minutes left. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, John. Uh, very much, very interesting. So do we have some questions for John? I saw Taylor, was it Taylor had a hand up? Yeah, can you see them here? So, um, can you see them in the chat there, John? Or um, I saw a hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, this Atiko has a hand up. Yeah. Atiko, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Oh, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. So, about the grammar and uh, extensive reading, that what I'm very, very serious, seriously uh, worried about Japanese students. Because in Japan, they teach grammar and grammar and grammar in junior high and senior high. So um, I started teaching an elementary 